warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good evening and best wish to all of us. We thank God Almighty because of the blessings and graces we can gather at a very special occasion today. Guest lecture three in one agricultural production technology course with material biodiversity for natural enemies and pest control. Previously, I say welcome to Professor Dr. Insinyur Agus Suryanto MS as the coordinator of the Plant Production Technology course. Welcome to Dr. Uma Komairo, SPMSE, as the moderator today. Welcome to Dr. Felix Spancy from Wikendingen University as the speaker today. And also welcome to all the audience. Once again, we say thank you for the presence of all the audience. Before we started this event, let us pray for each other belief. May God make this rewarding event for all of us, and the event will run smoothly and conducive. Pray, start. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the next agenda is speech and opening this event. The speech will be delivered by coordinator of the Plan Production Technology course, for Professor Dr. Insinyur Agus Suryanto, MS, time is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. <coughs> Honorable Dr. Damanhuri, Dean of Agriculture Faculty of Ravi Jaya University. Honorable Dr. Nurakmi Ardiarini, Head of Agriculture Department. <coughs> Honorable Head and Lecturer of Environment Resources Laboratory, Honorable Lecturer of Plant Production Technology Course. Prof. Agus. Yeah. Hello. 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 Puyana, Prof. Agus is here. Yes, uh, Prof. Agus is already speech. Carry on, Pak Agus. Lanjut, Pak Agus. Oh, okay. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Right. And uh, Honorable Dr. Felix Bianci from Wageningen University, who this afternoon will give a lecture about the biodiversity for natural enemies and pest control. And participant of CN1 program at Plant Production Technology Course. The CN1 program is a lecture program at Dravija University, which uh, involves teaching skill namely agriculture faculty lecturer, expert in plant production technology and uh, foreign lecturer. This program is one of Brawija University strategy in improving the quality of learning in the era of COVID-19 pandemic. The purpose of CN1 program is that students participating in the plant technology course can better understand plant production technology and the competent or plant production course can be achieved. Finally, I hope the student participating in this course can learn more from Dr. Felix Bianchi. Have a nice course and thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Dr. Insinyur Agus Suryanto MS for the speech and also opening the event today. All right, the next agenda is photo session. Please all the audience to turn on the camera. Photo will take in three, two, one, and smile. Okay, next pitch, please. Three, two, one, and smile. All right, thanks to all the participants. All right, ladies and gentlemen, for the next session, we'll be guided by moderator. For Dr. Uma Kumairo, SPMSE, time is yours. All right, Dr. Uma. Sorry, you're still mute. I think Dr. Uma's computer is freezing. 
Yes. Maybe we should wait for Dr. Uma a little longer. Yeah, just give her time, like five minutes, something. Sorry, uh, Professor Bianchi. No, no problem. <clears throat> Rafa Gus Rafa Gus Ya Eh Maybe we can start sooner while waiting okay. for Dr. Uma. Is it okay? That's it. It was okay. Maybe Bu. Hello. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Hello. <laughs> okay, Dr. Uma. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. Uh, I think the internet is unstable. Okay, and uh, good morning to Dr. Uh, Felix Bianchi and good afternoon to the head of Environmental Resources Laboratory. Course Coordinator Profesor Agus Suryanto, Lecturer and Staff of uh, UB, Lecturer and Staff of Taiyuan University, Student from uh, UB and Student from Taiyuan University who are currently doing exchange with uh, UB as well. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank to Dr. Felix for his availability. Although uh, in this situation, it is not uh, easy to commit with other duty. And before the lecture, I would like to give, uh, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Felix. Uh, Dr. Felix is an associate professor of farming system ecology group, Wageningen University and research uh, from the Netherlands. And before Wageningen, uh, Dr. Felix worked for Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization Australia. And uh, Dr. Uh, Felix works uh, focused on the ecology of agroecosystem with a special emphasis on herbivore natural animal interactions and pollination ecology with three main research lines, including resource disturbance and chemical ecology. And for today, uh, Prof. Felix will talk about pollination and pest control, uh, covering factors that underlie a uh, pest management problem in crop production system, and how to assess natural enemies and the mechanism underlying option to crop and habitat management to suppress pests. And if you have a question, you may write down in the chat or direct, directly address to Dr. Felix during or after the presentation. And uh, maybe we can have a, a short break in between, uh, uh, maybe uh, one hour from now, that we can uh, continue again later. So now please uh, welcome Dr. Felix uh, to give a uh, lecture on coordination. Please, Dr. Felix. Okay, thank you for your uh, introduction, uh, Uma. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, right. Let me see. If, is this, can you see my screen now? It's okay. Yeah, is it okay? All right. Well, it's really a, a pleasure and an honor to, to speak for, uh, for such a big audience uh, in, in Indonesia. 
Um, so, um, well, uh, Dr. Uma already um, uh, introduced me. And I, I would like to, to tell you something about um, uh, pollination and, and pest control. So in the, in the first hour, I will talk about uh, pest control, natural pest control. And second hour, um, I will talk about pollination. So if we think about um, biocontrol, um, there are many natural enemies outside uh, that we typically never always see, um, but actually it, it is a great service uh, because, because of the action of these natural enemies, as you can see here, for instance, a lady beetle feeding on an aphid, um, pest densities are often much lower than without these, uh, these natural enemies. And uh, there's this, this, this really uh, inspiring statement uh, that natural enemies prevent the vast majority of potential pest species from becoming pests. So uh, this actually indicates that um, if farmers uh, have to apply uh, pest uh, management practices, um, this is only in, in maybe in 5% in of the cases, because in the 95% of the cases, the natural enemies already uh, solved the, the, the problem by eating the pests. So these natural enemies are extremely valuable and we have to make sure that we conserve them because they, they provide these free, uh, free biocontrol services for, uh, without uh, costing any money. Um, so on the one hand, we know that natural enemies are very uh, effective or they can be very effective. But when you look at this slide, uh, you see that um, nevertheless, uh, pests are still a problem in many uh, crop produ uh, production systems. Uh, so for instance, uh, here, when we look at uh, the second line uh, for rice, um, there is still, um, if you wouldn't apply any pest management practices, uh, like for instance, insecticide applications, we would lose uh, about 77% um, of, uh, of, of, of the crops. Uh, this, this, this means that, that um, it's very important uh, to, to protect our crops. Uh, and even if we apply um, uh, insecticides, uh, we're still losing about 37% of, of our uh, crops and uh, of, of the rice crops. And um, so there is this really this, this, this confusion. Uh, on the one hand, we know that natural enemies are uh, effective. On the other hand, if you look in our uh, agroecosystems, eh, or for instance, in, in our rice crops, um, we see that we, there is still uh, a lot of damage. So how is this possible? It's a bit of a, of a paradox. Now, at least when I, when I, um, the, uh, when I study more, let's say, in, in, in European and Australian systems, um, typically what we see in our uh, cropping systems that these systems are dominated by, by crops and only a few crops. Uh, so there is a low biodiversity at multiple scales. Um, the crops are usually highly fertilized, so the, which makes them very uh, attractive and very high quality host plants for, for pest species. Um, in the landscapes, there are limited resources for natural enemies, for instance, for hibernation. So in the Netherlands, we have, we have strong winters. So uh, natural enemies have to find places uh, for, to overwinter. Um, and these are sometimes difficult to find because the crops, uh, the landscapes are composed of crops, only of crops um, and, and arable fields where they cannot uh, overwinter. Um, and there are many disturbances. So for instance, when you look typically what happens in, in, a, in a Dutch um, uh, system is that uh, fields are plowed, um, then there's a herbicide application, and then there's maybe uh, insecticide applications, uh, and then there is harvest. So there are many disturbances um, and many natural enemies uh, are not well, cannot cope well with that. And then finally, when there is a lot of insecticide use, there can be resistance development against chemical pesticides, insecticides. So we have to be really careful to make sure that we only use insecticides when it's really needed. So the learning outcomes of my presentation today for the first hour 
is uh, that I would like you to understand the factors that underlie pest management problems in crop production systems. And uh, also to be aware of the uh, ecological requisites for natural enemies. And so I want you to understand what natural enemies need in order to uh, survive and to provide to these, these valuable uh, pest control services. And then finally, um, I would like you to understand the mechanisms of how, uh, how we can manage our crops and, and, um, and, and landscapes to support uh, uh, natural enemies and that can suppress pests at the farm, at the field and farm and landscape scale. Um, but before I, I go into, into more detail, I, I would like to first um, tell you something, um, what I find extremely important. If we want to understand uh, biocontrol, it's very important to understand who are the natural enemies in the fields. Because if we don't have good information on this, it will be very hard to manage our fields and our landscapes in order to, to support them. So how, how can you do this? Well, one way is it may be a very simple way, but I think it's still a very effective way, is just by looking what you see happening in fields. And um, maybe in the old days, eh, maybe it, it looked like this, where people were sitting in, in the field, eh, but you can also do this um, with technology. Eh, so for instance, here is, is work uh, that a, a Chinese uh, postdoc that worked uh, uh, with me, uh, Cao Yi did. So he developed a kind of camera setting where he could record um, the pests and natural enemies um, in, in rice systems. And so, and he was particularly interested in, in brown plant hoppers. And I'm, I'm sure that, that you will have brown plant hoppers in, uh, in Indonesia as well. So what he did uh, at, at first, he said he had uh, dead brown plant hoppers. So it was very convenient because if you, if you put them in the, in the freezer, they will be dead and you can easily handle them and bring them to the field to record. Um, at the same time, uh, by doing this, uh, we found out that there was there was a problem, and I, I will I will show you um, what what was the problem. So here you see a, a video of the recordings of the um, the dead uh, uh, plant hoppers. And so here you see um, the uh, uh, spiders feeding on, on on the dead plant hoppers, and this was exactly what we expected. Um, so a little bit more spiders, jumping spiders, feeding. And then a rove beetle. Huh? We know rove beetles are also uh, predators. Huh? So this is exactly what we, what we would expect. And also when you read the literature on this, um, you, you expect it to find um, beetles, ground beetles. But here we got a bit uh, curious because a marsh fly is actually not a predator, it's, it's, um, it's more like a scavenger. So it will eat dead animals. Now, a snail will not um, eat a live um, uh, brown plant hoppers. So here we thought, okay, there's something wrong. And what was wrong is that we were uh, using dead uh, brown plant hoppers. And this attracts um, also uh, these grasshoppers, which also in, 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 in the real world will never eat alive brown plant hoppers. So at this point, we knew something is wrong and we should not use dead brown plant hoppers, but we should use live ones. Now, if you use live ones, um, uh, it looks like this. So uh, in these... Um, in this, in, in this video, you can actually see the plant hoppers running around. And then we saw, okay, we saw some of the same predators that we saw earlier for the dead brown plant, plant hoppers, but we will also see some more uh, surprises. So here, the, the ground beetle said that was exactly what we were expecting. But we also found birds. And this was, we never found any sign of this in, in, in literature. So, uh, and this really emphasizes that it's important to know who are the, the predators. And one of the surprises that we found here is that we found that indeed frogs are very important. And this was, uh, uh, made us realize 
that uh, in these paddy systems uh, with, with, with rice, um, we were actually thinking about, we thought uh, that, that there were, um, we were quite, we, we were not aware that these frogs were so important because they were in 75% of the cases where uh, brown plantarbs were eaten, they were frogs. So frogs are really important. And uh, this was really a new finding. Uh, at least we didn't find any papers reporting about this, eh? only about, um, about insects. And maybe this is because um, the most work on biological control is done by entomologists and they tend to look at insects. Eh? But then sometimes they overlook that there might be other creatures like these frogs. So this is just as, 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 a, as a starting point, eh? always make sure that, that you understand your system and uh, by looking at what you see happening can be very important can give you inf uh, crucial information to understand uh, biological control. Now, I first would like to start, um, if you think about how can we manage uh, biocontrol to support uh, pest control? Well, intercropping is actually a, a very nice example. And um, may maybe, I I'm, I'm not sure, is there a lot of intercropping in, um, in Indonesia? In agroforestry, yes, but in uh, food, I'm not. <laughs> now it's not really. Uh, yeah. Not so common. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now we we know that it's um, uh, there is it, it was a, a widespread in, in in Asia, Africa, South America, but it's mostly in in smallholder uh, farming settings. And uh, why why do farmers use it? Well, uh, often it can generate higher yields. Uh, and it can suppress uh, weeds, diseases, and pests. And even in the, uh, in, in the Netherlands, there is now also more interest uh, in this, and we are looking for ways how we can do this, for instance, by having strip cropping, uh, where you have uh, rows of maybe of, of, of three meters or six meters of certain crop, uh, and where you can still use the traffic to, to go, go through. So even in mechanized uh, systems, we are looking for this, and, and the reason for this is because of this potential for uh, weed disease and pest suppression. And um, now, how can it how can it work? Huh? That if you grow two crops close to each other, that you can get uh, a better uh, suppression of of your pests. And there are several mechanisms. So first, um, because you are having a, a mix of different plant species. Um, for herbivores eh, or pest species, it's more difficult to find a host plant because there are many other plants that are not a host plant. So the probability of finding a host plant is smaller in uh, intercroppings than in monocultures. Um, then if you have different plant species together, you get a different uh, uh, vegetation structure. And this also means that you have maybe more shaded areas or sunny areas or um, areas with, with high or low moisture. And this can uh, uh, makes provides a habitat for um, natural enemies. And so it's very common to find more natural enemies in, um, in, in mixed croppings than in monocroppings. Uh, now, in some cases, um, there is the possibility of, of trap cropping. And trap cropping means that there is there's a crop that's highly attractive uh, for pests. And so it, it really attracts the, um, the pest like, like a magnet, um, but it's not uh, like a cash crop. So even if, if the, the pests go into this uh, trap crop, uh, it, it does not have a high economic value. So uh, farmers don't care too much that if there is a high uh, pest density in these trap crops, um, and it, it can also um, uh, reduce the number of pests that will actually go in, 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 the, um, in, in, in the cash crop. Um, another example is that there could be a temporal continuity. Uh, so for instance, when you look in time, when crops overlap in time, and I will give an example of that, that natural enemies can go from one crop to another crop um, and can easily colonize uh, this, this second crop. Then there are some cases uh, where crops can be actually repellent. Uh, so actually they, uh, they can smell in a way that the pests don't like. So they, 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 they push the, the pests away. Uh, and this way you can uh, reduce the, the pest colonization. 
And um, I already discussed uh, that the improved microclimate, uh, this can, can result in um, reduced for, in a higher diversity and abundance of natural enemies. So I think it's good to, to give some examples of how this uh, may work uh, in, in the field. So here you see some, uh, it's a picture from, from Africa, um, where you see a maize plant uh, infested by stem borers. And stem borers can, can cause uh, up to 80% yield loss in, uh, in maize in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so here you see uh, on the right, you can see that the life cycle has, so actually the, uh, the larvae are boring inside the stem. And um, um, probably you also have stem borers in, in rice in Indonesia. And so it is probably the, the, the same. Uh, yeah, it, 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 these, these are uh, these insects, these larvae are very difficult to control because they are really hiding inside the stem. And even if you would use insecticides, you cannot reach them because they are really protected. Now, there is this uh, system of a push pull system. Uh, this has been developed in Kenya, uh, it's quite uh, famous. and in theory, it works like this. So, um, can you see my uh, my mouse? I'm mouse. Okay. No, sorry, the, 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 my pointer. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to find red. Yeah. <laughs> but could, could you could you can you see my yeah, pointer? Yeah. 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 yeah? Okay, so here you see the maize plants, which is the cash crop. So this is the, the crop that uh, uh, farmers want to grow. And uh, in this push-pull system, they grow uh, desmodium, uh, which is a, a kind of uh, fodder crop. You can use it to feed the, uh, the animals. Uh, and this is actually a repellent crop. So the chemicals that it releases pushes away uh, the stem borers. And then around uh, the fields, they, they plant napier grass. And this napier grass, you can also use it to, to feed the cows. Um, and um, this is quite attractive, but it's not, it does not have a high value and it can, can handle the, um, the infestation uh, of, of the stem borers quite well. So the, in theory, uh, the, um, by having this, this, this kind of intercrop, eh, because a push-pull system is basically a kind of uh, intercrop with a trap crop, eh, the napier grass, and a crop that actually repels the, uh, the stem borers. And, and this way, um, the, um, the stem borer densities on, on maize are, are lower. So uh, this is how it looks in the field. Here you see the, the, the maize plants, the desmodium uh, in between in the rows, and around it, you have the, the trap crop of the, the, um, of the napier grass. Uh, one uh, added benefit uh, from, uh, from this is that uh, it can also control striga, uh, which is a parasitic weed in, um, in, in Africa. So that, that can, is an added benefit. Uh, so overall, um, this can, can really uh, have, an, uh, yeah, it can also uh, help in controlling weeds. And as, as I said, you can uh, farmers can, can use the, um, uh, the the napier grass for uh, for feeding uh, the cows. Now another example of um, uh, strip uh, of, of um, uh, intercropping is a system that has been developed in China. And here you see here at the, at the bottom uh, you see a field of uh, of wheat, and in between there is soy. And um, now wheat uh, has some uh, wheat aphids, but this is not, not a uh, very important crop, uh, sorry, not an important pest. But this, uh, the wheat aphids, they attract natural enemies like this uh, lady beetle. So it's very common to see many lady beetles feeding on the wheat, um, uh, on, on the wheat aphids uh, in the wheat uh, crops. And now later in the season, uh, there is soy um, sorry, it's cotton is plant, and cotton is attacked by the cotton aphid, and this is really a problem. Um, but by using this um, intercrop, uh, the predators, the lady beetles, can easily, um, after harvest of the, uh, the wheat, can, can easily colonize um, the, uh, the cotton uh, crops and, and feed on the, um, on the, uh, the cotton aphids. 
And here are just just some 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 slides to see how how well this this works. Uh, so we have um, when we look at at the the, the, uh, the open uh, the open uh, circles. This is the system where we have a, a monocrop. Right? So here we have uh, cotton only, and there we see that for in in two years um, the number of uh, uh, cotton aphids are higher in the in the monocrop and right? the cotton fields than in the um, than in the intercrop. So in the intercrop, actually, the numbers are quite quite low. Uh, and this is true for the alata. Uh, so this is the aphids that don't have wings, but also for the, uh, the aphids that do have wings. Uh, so you see at the bottom here that the, the number of uh, cotton aphids in the systems like this are really low. And the reason for this is that there are the, uh, the lady beetles are much higher. So here in this uh, intercrop system, you can see that they are, the lady beetles are much higher there are much more predators than uh, in the um, in the monocultures, and so this really shows that this is a is a very inspiring case of how you can use crop diversity to retain the um, the, the natural enemies uh, in your in your cropping system, and there's no need to use uh, insecticides. Now, another way how you can retain uh, natural enemies is to provide food resources. Now, what kind of resources um, do um, that your enemies need? And may maybe you think, well, uh, maybe they, they need prey, something to, to eat on, eh? like, uh, like pest insects. Um, and this is indeed uh, true, but um, there are also other resources that they need. And this I would like to show in, in the next uh, video. So here you see an um, paras parasitoids feeding on, on a buckwheat uh, plant, and it's taking uh, the feeding on the nectar. And this nectar provides, it, it's a sugar source, which is, uh, is needed for, to, um, uh, to, to provide the energy needed for flight. And when this uh, parasite has been eating on, on the nectar, then he has uh, sufficient or in this case, it's, it's a she, um, because then, then she can uh, find hosts here, like you see, it's like, a, like an aphid, and she injects an egg inside the, the aphid. And so, um, and this is what will happen. There will be an egg of the parasite inside the aphid. And then the, um, the, uh, the parasite will develop inside the aphid. The host, it will kill the aphid, and then a new parasitoid uh, will emerge, as you can see here on, on the video. And this is very common. So parasitoids are very effective control agents, but they can only be effective if they provide, have sufficient food to eat, including uh, nectar resources. So uh, here you see an overview of um, what, what natural enemies need. And so um, indeed, um, prey, also when there is no prey uh, in the crop habitats, uh, floral food resources, eh, like, like we uh, saw for the, for the parasitoids, uh, they need shelter. Eh? For instance, if, if a farmer is using insecticides, they have a place to, to hide. <clears throat> well, in the, um, in the temperate zone eh, where, we live, where I, I come from, um, hibernation, eh, overwintering is very important and overall a favorable uh, microclimate. And, and maybe in Indonesia, it, it can be actually good to have some shade. And when it's very hot during the day, um, it might be good to have some, some shaded areas where natural enemies, where the temperatures are a bit lower. And um, the way how the farmers in the Netherlands, um, in some cases, try to uh, help natural enemies is by planting these flower strips. And they are uh, nectar resources for, um, uh, for parasitoids and other natural enemies. And then they hope that they will, uh, after a, a nice meal of, of nectar, that they will go into the fields to provide pest control services, and just like we saw on the video. Um, it is important, however, that um, the natural enemies uh, are able to get access to the nectar. And because it depends also on, on the uh, architecture of the, of the flower. 
So, for instance, if the the um, the tube of the flower is very narrow, uh, like you see on, on this slide, uh, and and the um, the nectar will be somewhere uh, on 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 the in these spots, uh, you can imagine that if if a, uh, if a predator has a big big head, it will not be able to enter this this tube. So it's really um, it, it, uh, you really this need, really needs to be a, a, a match between the architecture of the flower and uh, the, the morphology of, of the mouth parts of the um, of, of the natural enemies. Uh, so in this case, um, having flowers like this will not be uh, beneficial for parasitoids because their head is just too big. So they ne really need um, plants that have superficial. Uh, nectar, uh, just like uh, buckwheat that we show, saw on, on the on the video. And uh, well, here's just just a graph to show that if you pick the right uh, mix of flowers, then you can indeed get um, a better uh, colonization or higher abundance of natural enemies inside the fields, uh, who then can provide uh, the pest control services. <coughs> okay, now I would like to move to the third spatial scale, which is um, the landscape scale. And for this, I would like to go to China and again to the work of uh, Cao Yi, um, where he studied um, uh, the, 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 uh, the production of, of rice. Uh, and he is, uh, also investigated um, how this is affected by the use of insecticides and, uh, and, and, and how biological control functions. So, so he did this work uh, not only in, 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 one, uh, in one field or in, in one uh, site, but he visited it in, in many sites. And as you can see here, there were about uh, 20 sites and each had uh, contained of uh, rice crops, um, uh, forest, grasslands, uh, and so on, but they all were a bit, bit different. And we were also interested in um, how this landscape surrounding um, the, uh, the 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 uh, the rice fields. How that influenced um, the the biocontrol potential. Now, um, so so he started with an experiment where he asked uh, farmers um, had to have who had rice fields in each of those that landscape. And so we had twenty rice fields in in um, in total, and each one was surrounded by by a certain landscape. And um, so he asked the farmers whether they have uh, to keep an area in the rice fields um, without insecticide use. And so the whole field was managed according to management practices, according to the farmer. Uh, but in, in, in one area, uh, there was no insecticide. And then he compared uh, the natural enemies and, and, and the yields uh, in the sprayed areas and in the unsprayed uh, areas. And what he found was that in the unsprayed area, uh, indicated here by the U, um, the pests were higher than in the sprayed area. Uh, and this is made sense uh, because I mean, farmers don't spray insecticides for nothing. So this was exactly what we expected. And um, he also found that in the unsprayed areas, there were still more natural enemies, uh, predators and parasitoids. And that was actually also what we expect because we know that uh, many insecticides, they do not only, um, are not only bad for the pests, but also for the natural enemies. Um, then he found that um, in, in, the, uh, in the unsprayed plots, uh, because there were le less uh, pests, there was also less damage eh, in, in dead heart and, and rolled leaves. Eh, and that was also more or less what we expected. And therefore, the yields were also higher. And so in, in a sense, um, it confirmed what we already thought, that um, if you use insecticides, um, you have less pests, less natural enemies, you have less crop injury, and you had about 20% higher yields. Um, but uh, then we were quite interested, well, how is it? How about is this biocontrol? How efficient are uh, natural enemies to support uh, these pest control services? And in order to study this, um, so he conducted a, a cage experiment. So he had um, a, 
um, he had plant, uh, rice plants um, where we introduced a fixed number of brown plant hoppers and put a cage around it. So uh, there were no uh, predators inside the cage. So those uh, brown plant hoppers inside the cage, and which you can, you can see here, they were quite happy because they, there were no natural enemies and they could reproduce um, without problems. And um, he compared uh, those numbers with um, brown plant hoppers that were also uh, had the same treatment had the same number of brown plant hoppers provided on plants in these open cages. Um, but there, obviously, natural enemies could come and feed on the brown plant hoppers. And he found that um, there was a big difference between the brown plant hoppers when you exclude natural enemies. Um, and this indicates that um, actually these natural enemies are quite effective in reducing brown plant hoppers. And so this is indicating this big difference, particularly in 2005, uh, that there is um, this, these biocontrol agents uh, that the predators are very uh, efficient. However, they are not as efficient as the pesticides uh, because we saw in the previous slide that uh, then you get even, even better uh, control. Uh, but there are many uh, natural enemies and this biocontrol potential is quite high. And uh, well, maybe it, it is done because of these, um, these frogs that I showed you earlier. Um, and we, we, we then we found this uh, high potential in, in, in every landscape. So it was not uh, influenced by the landscape context. And then we looked a bit further because, well, what does it mean? So if you apply insecticides, you get uh, a yield increase of about 20%. But of course, you also have to buy these um, uh, insecticides. So what would it be? Uh, what is the economic performance? And for that, um, Toyil uh, worked with 17 farmers. And then he found out that um, if farmers do not um, account for, um, um, for uh, uh, labor costs, uh, that in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in eight out of 70 uh, cases, it was actually profitable to use insecticides. However, in in nine out of 17 cases, it was not profitable. Uh, in this case, uh, farmers um, paid more money for to buy the insecticides than the, the, the value of the, the added 20% yield increase of the rice. Now, if you do this kind of computation and also account for the uh, labor costs, eh, because when farmers have to go in the field, I mean, basically you could say, well, they, they, they should earn some kind of lay, uh, some, some, some wages. Um, then this, this comes to about, um, that's only profitable in five out of 17 cases. And um, so this, this really questions um, the net benefit of using insecticide applications, eh? because it's, it's only profitable in, let's say, maybe in somewhat less than 50% of the cases. And um, you could also say, well, what if the, the farmers, um, if they would spend the money that they would spend on, on, on insecticides in, in a kind of shared resource. And so then they have a, maybe a bag of money where they put the money uh, what they would normally spend on the insecticides. And if they, they use that to give some of that money to farmers who were strongly affected uh, by pests, well, in that case, they, they would have, uh, they, uh, they could break even. So that, that, that would cost the same amount of money but in that case, they don't have to spray the fields with insecticides. And there are also no negative effects on, um, of the insecticides on their health, eh? because it's, it's well known that, that if you spray, spray insecticides, it's, not, it's often not healthy for farmers. And it has an, an, um, a negative effect on the biodiversity. And so this, this really uh, shows that we really have to think um, when we should use um, insecticides and um, think very carefully what's really the added benefit because this study shows that there is not a really strong economic benefit of using insecticides. Um, well, and the use of insecticides, it can have also not only influence um, biocontrol in, your, uh, in the field where it's supplied, but it's also uh, can influence the um, biocontrol in the 
adjacent fields. And in order to, to study this, I developed um, a simulation model. And I, I, will, I won't go uh, into, into a lot of uh, detail, but actually what you, um, what, what you show here, here is, is this graph where you have on, on the x-axis, that's the, the, the fraction of the area uh, of non-sprayed fields. And if we see if there is no uh, pesticide at all in the whole landscape, and we can see here the landscape with, with uh, sprayed and non-sprayed uh, fields. So suppose if there wouldn't be any insecticide applications, we get a high level of parasitism. And remember that the, the, uh, the parasitism that I showed in the video with uh, um, um, the parasoids uh, that was laying an egg inside uh, the aphid. Now, if you don't use any insecticide, you get a high level of um, of parasitism, and if you use um, a lot of uh, insecticide, so if each field in the landscape would be sprayed, then uh, the natural enemies that the parasites cannot establish because they they are killed because they they are inside the host uh, inside the, uh, the the pest, and if you then start to increase the um, the the number of fields that are not sprayed then we see that there is a sudden change from an area. Uh, so here we, we have, uh, if let's say 60% of the landscape is sprayed with insecticides and only 40% not sprayed, um, then there is still no parasitism in the landscape because the parasites will be moving from one field to another. And if they end up um, in a field where there's, a, uh, there's an insecticide application, they will still be killed. And this, uh, this study actually shows that there are, there are likely to be strong thresholds in, in biocontrol. And maybe the best way to, to show this is by another video. And um, so here we have a case where we have 30% of the uh, landscape is not sprayed with insecticide, which means that 70% of the fields are sprayed with insecticides. And what we see um, when we run this simulation, we see here in the green that the pest populations, and they are uh, reduced by using the insecticide application. Every when they get too high, farmers will apply insecticide and the pest population will be reduced. So here we have control, but it's only based on the use of, of chemical insecticides. Now, if we have a landscape, not with 30% uh, of the fields not sprayed, but 80%, so then there is much less fields you use with insecticides, we get a different dynamic. So at first we start with a very low number of, uh, of parasitoids, uh, and then that, um, but after they, they increase, then we, we see that the uh, uh, natural enemies can establish and they can provide these, these pest control services. And this really shows that um, there might be thresholds in the number of fields in the landscape that are sprayed with insecticides. And if it's too high, um, we're going to miss out on important uh, pest control services provided by these insecticides. And so once again, we should be very careful to uh, only use insecticides when it's really needed. And then I would like to move on to the farmers um, because um, I know that, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, um, most uh, uh, advice for uh, for crop protection, um, it's done by it's not by the government, by 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 commercial uh, companies who also sell insecticides, and um, we we notice that uh, farmers know very little about uh, the pests and natural enemies, and so. Um, Actually, it would be very good for farmers if they would make videos uh, like I showed earlier, huh, where you look at the natural enemies that are controlling your, uh, your pest. Uh, and uh, on average, uh, farmers know only about two to three pests and, and less than one natural enemy per, per crop type. Uh, and this is across uh, the globe. Um, and um, many farmers, uh, more than uh, uh, nearly 70% of the farmers are not aware of these biological control um, processes. And we found that um, particularly in, in, in cash crops, uh, with, with uh, uh, crops that have a high value, that farmers that don't know their natural enemies and that are not scouting their fields and looking in their fields whether there are natural enemies around, um, that they tend to use more insecticides. So it really shows the importance uh, to help farmers 
uh, to recognize uh, beneficial uh, predators and, and parasites that can provide uh, pest control services, eh? or maybe e even the frogs or the birds eh? that, that we've seen. So it's really important to help farmers uh, to do this, because um, if the farmers don't know these uh, their uh, natural enemies of the pests, um, well, they, they, they are losing their skills and they, uh, they, are, they tend to use more uh, insecticides, which can be um, bad news for the uh, biocontrol at, um, uh, in the landscape. Eh? Because we just saw in, in the previous slide that um, these, uh, if you spray uh, insecticides in, 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 in the fields, it not only affects biocontrol in the field where it's sprayed, but also in the neighboring fields. Um, now, this brings me to the final slide of the first hour and the take home messages, which I hope you will uh, take on, uh, take on board, is that if you want to understand uh, pest problems, uh, we need to look at um, the production system uh, and in the landscape context. So what, what, who are the natural enemies and uh, what kind, what do these natural enemies uh, need? Um, so uh, plant production systems have a temporal and spatial continuity, uh, like for instance, the intercropping uh, or the, uh, the ones with the, with the flower strips, they can support effective natural enemy populations, which can help to suppress pest populations. Uh, and this reduces the need for insecticides. Um, however, these natural enemies, uh, they uh, depend on resources that are often provided by non-crop habitats, um, uh, for instance, for, for flowers, for, for nectar, or the places to for shelter. Um, well, I discussed uh, habitat management options at the, at the field level, uh, the intercropping, um, at, the, um, at the farm level, uh, where you could have maybe a network of, of flower strips or, or uh, uh, buns with, of, of paddies, uh, and the landscape scale, uh, where we can actually would, would like to, to manage, reduce the number of, of insecticide applications at the landscape scale. And um, yeah, we, we just saw that, that uh, if you're using too much insecticides, that this, this can actually have a very negative effect on my control. And this, this can, is this dangerous because then uh, we're continuing to use even more insecticides, which, um, well, which is costly uh, and can have negative effects on, 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 on the health of the farmers, uh, on the biodiversity uh, and, uh, so it, 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 it can be really, um, it's important to, to conserve these natural enemies eh? and, and only use insecticides when it's really needed. So this is what I, it's a long story, I guess. So I can imagine that there might be some questions. So I'm happy yeah. to take on. Thank you, Dr. Felix. There are a lot of questions here. I'm not sure if we can address all questions. Uh, but uh, we can pick some interesting question. For example, the first question from uh, Dr. Sitawati, I think. Uh, yeah, this this is an interesting question because uh, it's maybe also related to, uh, as you know, uh, we have a complex rice system project. Yeah? Uh, we implement it uh, in a landscape scale. Uh, 50 hectares in Lamongan, and now we start in Malang for, uh, we plan to have 100 hectares. Um, so the question of uh, pro, uh, Dr. Sitawati is, in a small land, intercropping is easy to apply, but on the large uh, land, how to apply intercropping without reduce uh, yield uh, the main crop? So is this question uh, at, the, at the spatial scale to implement um, intercropping? Intercropping, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah because it's, so it, it's typically done by, by smallholder farmers who have small mm -hmm. fields, mm -hmm. uh, because the drawback of this is it's labor intensive. Uh, so mm -hmm. farmers are doing, uh, managing uh, and planting by hand. And mm -hmm. uh, this, if you want to do this at, at a larger spatial scale, um, this, this becomes very difficult indeed. And um, it, it is too much work for one, one farmer. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if there are possibilities for to, to mechanize this, yeah? because I, I, I know that I've, I've seen in, in South Asia, um, sometimes these handheld tractors, said the smaller ones that, that, you, that you can use to go through your uh, fields or even, even your, your um, rice paddy. 
um, but still, um, I'm not sure if that level of mechanization would be sufficient to mm -hmm. to to implement the intercrops mm -hmm. at the scales that, that you are interested in. Um, yeah. I know that there in, 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 in Wageningen, for instance, we are developing um, also robotic systems, um, but th this is really uh, high tech and, and it's uh, mm -hmm. still in development. So they, they don't really exist. Well, there, mm -hmm. there are some example uh, robots that, 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 uh, that work, but it's still work in development. But mm -hmm. who knows, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe in, in, in 10 or 20 years time, there, there might be robots who could uh, help also with the mechanization. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, the one uh, with the strike cropping with, I forgot the name of the company in the Netherlands, uh, Earth and something. Earth, yes. Yes. So, yes, this is an organic uh, uh, farming uh, company. And they, they are actually the largest um, organic farming company in the Netherlands. And they, they are also uh, testing uh, the strip cropping. Uh, so they, they're using uh, strips. Um, I'm not sure. It could be maybe even up to, to six meters wide. Uh, but still, they, they are quite happy with the results. Because even if you have strips of six meter of the same, uh, same crop, and then next to it is a six meter strip of another crop, um, it can still prevent uh, the, the exchange of, 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 the, um, of, the, of the diseases and, and, and pests within, mm -hmm. within this field. Because uh, particularly for, for, uh, for diseases, uh, when, it, when a spore of, of, of a disease uh, lands on, on, on another crop, uh, often this is not a host crop. And then, then um, it will actually kill the spore. Uh, so there, there, there are still diseases, uh, but they, they spread less uh, fast because they, they are the, the constraints to, to this, this width of, of six meters and not the whole field. Yeah, yeah and that can be a, an example, yeah, because they have uh, quite a big, uh, big uh, scale farm, yeah, uh, I think hundreds uh, hectares. And okay, uh, let's move to the next question. If we import natural enemies from abroad into our country, can uh, uh, there is like uh, there's competition between natural enemies uh, between introduced and uh, native uh, natural enemies? How to avoid this? Yes, I um, uh, of course you can. Uh, it, it's quite like in classical biological control. Um, people used to to take uh, natural enemies uh, from abroad and and bring them uh, into a country. Um, I would be careful with that because, I mean, there, there are some uh, bad examples where uh, these um, introduced natural enemies that they uh, behave differently than anticipated and they may maybe, um, maybe also um, attack um, other non-target um, insects uh, that, that can be actually, uh, can, can be endangered, for instance. So my, my advice here would be, First, look at the, the, the native natural enemies. Eh? Um, see if, if they can do the job, and 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 only if they there are no natural enemies that, that are uh, already existing uh, in, in uh, Indonesia. I would look at at uh, importing one, but I had but you have to be very very careful uh, because mm -hmm. um, there are some some bad examples of it, and um, yeah. So so I, I would really emphasize first look what. What, what kind of natural enemies are already uh, um, endemic in Indonesia and, and try to, to help those instead of introducing new ones. Yeah, uh, we have too many questions. Uh, I think we cannot address all, but uh, let me pick one more and then I do not know how to solve this. Uh, one more. Uh, I think this is about... Uh, Larvae inside, maybe a stem borer, yeah? How to, uh, to solve the problem of this uh, stem borer? Mm -hmm. the yeah, so I, I think stem. you have also stem borers in rice. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there yeah. are a lot of yeah. stem borers. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I gave an example of, of the push-pull system, which actually developed mm -hmm. in, in Kenya and in Africa uh, for maize systems. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they are really mm -hmm. difficult to control because the, the, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the larvae are, are tunneling inside the, the, the stem. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, I know that in, in Africa that there, there are some parasitoids that actually can go inside the stem and to, to parasitize um, the stem borer larvae, but usually they're not very effective. Uh, they are probably, at, at, at most, they have maybe 10% parasitism uh, rate, which is it's not a lot. Mm -hmm. It's not sufficient to, to control them. Mm -hmm. um, I, what, I, what I think what you need is, is, is really a, a biodiverse a system where there are many natural enemies that can already um uh, eat also let's say the the eggs uh, which which are st still uh, able to eat and uh, can, can be eaten by 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 predators and and keeping the the, the adult uh, densities low um and and typically what we see is that that uh, if you have uh, in landscapes where you have a lot of rice um there's a lot of host plants for this uh, for these stem borers and that that will generate a high mm -hmm. populations of stem borers. Mm -hmm. However, if you have less rice or maybe you have uh, intercrops of rice yeah, so that they're not so visible for the stem borers, uh, typically in those landscapes, you have less densities of, of, of uh, adult um, uh, stem borers that they will lay the eggs on the plants. Um, and uh, so, so basically, uh, I, I think diversification strategies uh, at, at the landscape scale could be helpful here. But of course, it's not so easy to organize because I mean, farmers they they decide what kind of um, crops they they, they plant, eh? and and they, they will not say, well, I'm I'm not going to plant rice uh, this day because otherwise I'll have too too much rice in the landscape for two, uh, which may may uh, elevate the the stem borer um, uh, densities. Uh, but 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 overall, um, may, may, maybe intercropping systems could 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 be uh, could be uh, helpful here. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Felix. Uh, as the conclusion, maybe the using a biodiversity approach uh, can be an integrated approach as well, because uh, maybe one uh, natural enemies uh, can have other relation with others than this uh, uh, stem borer uh, can have a direct or indirect uh, impact from this uh, biodiversity. And, uh, should we have a break? What do you think? Maybe can I get get some um, some water and be back okay. in two minutes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Please. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. Mm. Gimana, Prof. Agus? Ini nggak apa-apa dua dua jam ini, guys. Oh, nggak masalah. Okay. Ini masih banyak masih banyak pertanyaan. Langge ini gimana ini Bu? Question from the student, I think so. <coughs> if uh, Dr. Felix is okay, it's okay <coughs> because uh, I think it's, it's very good, it's very nice. Uh, uh, many uh, student uh, give a Maybe. question here, yeah, Bu Maya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there is uh, one more uh, topic on pollination. Hmm. Oh, iya, 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 Bu iya, iya, Bu iya, 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 kan iya, 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 Nggak, maksud saya kalau masih banyak pertanyaan mahasiswa itu saya kira menarik biar biar okay. diskusi dengan mahasiswanya gimana? Ini nanti ditanyakan saja nih. Mm -hmm. Dia mau lanjutkan uh, topiknya dia atau kita jawab satu persatu pertanyaan? Ya. Yeah. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. <tuh> Mas Adi, Bu Ois. Kita sudah siap untuk satu jam lagi sampai jam kita sampai jam lima lima ya selesai ya oke okay, Prof Agus okay. let's continue Enggak kalau mau minum-minum dulu. Oke. 
Okay. <laughs> Dr. Felix, what do you think? Should we continue with the questions or with the uh, uh, the next uh, topic? I mean, that doesn't matter. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the students. So, okay. so what, what the students prefer, I, if there are still, maybe, yeah. Um, I guess if you have questions, you can learn a lot by uh, questions. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe if there's a few more questions uh, that I'm happy to take them on. Um, and then, uh, then we can see how much time there is for the pollination part. And, um, mm -hmm. and maybe I, I, I can shorten it a bit, but it, it really depends on, on, on what, the, what the students want. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, uh, I think maybe better we address their own questions. Okay. And then we'll see if uh, there's some more time to do uh, the pollination part. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. I will. Okay, so then. Maybe I can I can then should I should I stop sharing? Yeah. Fine. Mm, this is from uh, Sony. Uh Prophelix, I saw in your movie on the cat before feet on the past in both diurnal and nocturnal, for example, spider. Is that and uh, is there any data? How effective is it and how Many kills in a day. I I, I didn't, didn't entirely hear uh, the question. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, uh, the the company for fit on the past. I'm also not sure uh, what company for mean. Is it a frog or a spider? A ah, spider. Uh, is there any data? Um. Yeah. I think spiders are very common in in uh, in rice system. Actually, in, in in almost any any crop. Um, and yes, they. Uh, I think one of one of the, the the special attributes is that they often are ready early in in the in the growing season. So often, when the plants are uh, planted, often the spiders come in very very early, and they they can um, live very long without having a prey. Uh, so they are ready waiting and sitting there and as soon as, as the pests uh, arrive they're already there so that that can make them uh, efficient uh, biocontrol agents um, so yes I, I think spiders are uh, important huh? but of course um, well in, in in our observations in the um, in, in, in the rice with the brown plant hoppers uh, actually we found that the, the the frogs were the most important because they killed mm -hmm. 75% of, of the kills that were recorded uh, on the camera were done by, by, by frogs. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is data on that, yeah? Yeah. And... Uh, if you look at the role of spiders, if you look in, in literature, then you'll find, uh, I, I think that there should be um, studies that, that, that show this. And there are also studies, for instance, where they look at the gut contents uh, and they, they see, mm -hmm. look at what kind of uh, prey the uh, spiders have been eaten. So there is there, there should be a lot of information on that. Okay, okay, and this must be uh, very difficult, yeah, to dissect the spider to see. Yeah, I, I never done, done it. I never <laughs> I did, done it myself. I did with the duck and fish, but they are big, ah. so it's easy. <laughs> but with yeah. spider, I do not know. Yeah, but you can learn important things eh? just by looking eh, exactly like like Uma, like you say. Eh, I'm just looking what the, what the ducks are and what the fish are eating. Uh, mm -hmm. You can learn a lot of things about it. So I, yeah. I, I really think it's it is a very good idea yeah. to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw so many things inside the fish as well. Yeah. Okay. The next question is uh, by Arik Nisa. Sustainable agriculture ensure our food security, economic return to farmers safe to environment and socially acceptable, but how to design sustainable cropping system for different regions with different soil and water resource was a big question. What step have to take uh, or what thing have to be ensured to make the system sustainable? Yes, Ooh. this is <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. Uh, it's also a very important question. Yeah. And I, I think there are many people thinking about how, how should we do this? Um, mm. And there, there are some um, some things that I can say. I mean, I don't have the answer to this question because if, if I knew the answer, uh, I, I would be 
very busy telling people how to do this. Um, but I think one of the things that, that's very important is that um, if we use pest management insecticides, um, for instance, it, it will not only affect uh, the, the have a negative effect on, on the on the biocontrol in your own fields, but also of, of your neighbors, because the, the natural enemies they will be flying from one farm to the other. Uh, they they don't recognize uh, farm borders, so we have to do this uh, at the landscape scale. So we have to um, farmers have to somehow be helped to 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 know to understand um, that we can um, have. Um, management practices that are friendly for natural enemies and, and parasitoids. Uh, and this has to be done beyond the farm scale at the landscape scale. Um, of course, um, farmers cannot do this alone. So we also have to think about policies um, mm -hmm. that, that are, for instance, or, or mm -hmm. help that can help um, farmers. For instance, a very nice example is, for instance, the, the farmer field schools that have been, uh, been very effective in um, in Indonesia. Um, I'm, I, I don't know the latest update. I, I have heard, at least in different parts of the world, that um, the, the knowledge of, about, of, of the farmers eh, about um, natural enemies have been declined and that they are more, using more and more uh, insecticides. I'm not sure how that is currently in Indonesia, but very clearly that uh, support for farmers to, to help to learn about biocontrol, about uh, agroecology, um, diversified systems uh, that can definitely uh, help. Um, maybe there's, I think there should also be uh, government restrictions or legislation on the use of insecticides um, had to, to reduce because uh, it has a negative effect on, on biocontrol and it may provide on the short term uh, suppression of, of your pest densities, but you're also killing your natural enemies and that, that will uh, have a negative effect on the biocontrol of your neighbor but also later in time, because mm -hmm. typically pest population, they can increase very rapidly. And uh, when there are no natural enemies around, uh, then the, the problems get only get worse. Uh, so in, in that sense, insecticides are actually a kind of bad medicine. Uh, so they, they help mm -hmm. on the short term, but not on the long term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting, yeah, uh, to have uh, uh, for the sustainable landscape approach is like uh yeah almost uh compulsory and we will have the workshop about um, uh, habitat designing habitat management actually in uh in november but uh, you do not have time to to be uh there maybe uh so i invited jody and other uh, colleagues to be there okay and the next uh from Salman Shah Uta Gaul. Uh, is the use of natural enemies alone enough in the agricultural landscape system to suppress uh, pest population? Should it be accompanied by the use of insecticides that work more efficiently in killing pests, which on the other hand can kill natural enemies or have an impact on the agroecosystem itself? Yeah, should uh, the use of natural enemies accompanied by insecticides? Yeah, so um, the, the way I interpret this, this question is, um, are, can natural enemies, can they sufficiently suppress natural enemies? Um, and I think that this depends on, on, on the landscape context indeed. So maybe if, if there have only a few natural enemies, eh, because there are lots of insecticides and there's a lot of rice in the system, for, uh, for instance, eh, then, then you get a lot of uh, insecticide, uh, a lot of um, uh, pest entities, then um, natural enemies, they, they, it will need time to build up their numbers. Eh? Like the mm -hmm. way I, I showed in, in, in the video, eh, when, when you had a very low level of, of Parasitoids. It, it took a, a long while before they can actually have a su sufficient large number of of, um, uh, of parasitoids, and uh, this might be too long for farmers because they, they will suffering uh, um, from uh, uh, yield uh, deficits because of the the, the, the pest infestation. So, um, I think in, if you have landscapes that are well suited for natural enemy severance with, with small fields with many buns with many frogs. Um, I think biocontrol can be uh, quite effective. Um, however, um, if you have landscapes that are not so friendly for natural enemies, then um, it will take time to, to build up their numbers and it will take a long time. And 
farmers probably mm -hmm. will not wait for that and they will start to use insecticides which makes yeah. it that yeah. makes it more and more difficult to to rely on it so mm -hmm. you could even um see it kind of two states so one state is, is insecticide dominated uh, crops um uh, cropping systems where you are using insecticides killing your natural enemies and strengthening you uh, the need for insecticides so it is a kind of kind of loop which can can lead to a kind of pesticide treadmill or you have a system where you have a good bio control and there's no need for for insecticides and this this can uh, let your enemies can benefit from this and they can strengthen so it's, it's really like a two two domains that yeah? is two two valleys for instance and and um it, it might be very difficult if you are in in this state to go back to this state then it, it will probably take a long time and a lot of um mm -hmm pest pressure and uh and, and damage mm -hmm. so then mm -hmm. then it will be difficult mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> okay and the next question uh this is use of uh, vinegar as a weed killer in organic crop production production system is it a lot <laughs> no i don't know this is a regulation for organic thing i think is it okay to use vinegar Hello. 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 Can you hear me? You talking to me or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't get the 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 the, the question. The, the, the question. Hear? Yes. Yeah. It was about organic, but I, I didn't quite. Yeah. Uh... Uh, the question, can we use vinegar as a weed killer in organic crop production system? Vinegar? Oh, vinegar. Yeah, vinegar. Ah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I've never I heard about so. it. So what, where do they use it? Maybe I can learn something here from, from you guys. Uh, what, what do they use it for? I've also never heard it. Yeah. I've never used it. I, well, I know that there, there in organic agriculture, right, you're allowed to use some uh, plant-based uh, materials right, mm -hmm. like neem, um, mm -hmm. and and those um, can can be uh, yeah can be used are allowed to to, to use them. Um, I would always still be be careful to use them because, like synthetic uh, insecticides, some of them are are uh, also working broad spectrum. That means that they are not only killing. Uh, uh, the pest, but also uh, the natural enemies. Um, oh, and so uh, there, there are some examples of um, uh, botanic uh, uh, insecticides that are, are allowed in organic agriculture, but they, they can still, still have a negative effect on, on um, biocontrol agents. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I know it's happening, uh, farmers are, are using it. Some of them are very specific, and um, like for Bacillus thiruguensis, they, they are quite specific. Uh, and I think that they are not so, so harmful. Uh, there are um, other ones uh, that I think, you, yeah, think carefully before you use it because it's a bit of a bad medicine medicine eh? like i said before mm -hmm. they they can help at the short term but they also inflicting damage which mm -hmm. will cause problems uh, later on or maybe mm -hmm. at your neighbor's uh, farm okay yeah maybe prof agus have you ever heard about the use of vinegar uh, uh, sorry I, I don't know about the vinegar but, but uh, <laughs> maybe busita <laughs> Oh yeah. Okay. Busita. No. Uh yes. Uh sometime in uh in a pot we can spray with vinegar to control what is the fungus, maybe? Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. yeah, I can I can imagine maybe for fung fungi it, it might uh, have an effect. So actually you're lowering the pH. You're, getting, you're creating an acid environment that, that might be difficult for, for fungi to, to survive. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, new knowledge. Uh, next, uh, uh, this is from Machine, from Yang. Uh, the role of pests on farm. What happens if pest species on farm goes extinct? <laughs> Can you say again what happens if, if the pest po population at farms go extinct? Yeah, if there's no any pest on the farm, 
What yeah, happened? well, I, I think that that will not not happen because um, I mean there are many many insects um, in uh, around farms on the farms, uh, and they are also mobile, so they're they're moving all over the place. So if even if you even if if you apply an uh, insecticide application or uh, um, uh, or natural enemies are very effective, there will always be uh, new insects moving in, inside uh, the fields. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't think that this will happen. What what will happen if after an, an insecticide application that the population densities of the pests but also of the natural enemies will be low, but then there will be recolonization. And uh, often uh, the pests are earlier and in higher numbers than the natural enemies. Uh, so it, it's quite common that after having an um, uh, insecticide uh, application, that um, you you get get a, a kind of secondary pest outbreak um, because um, there are no uh, natural enemies anymore, and and the the, the herbivores that are coming, uh, they, there's no there's no enemies, so they they can increase their numbers and and farmers maybe have to spray again. And then, then you get mm-hmm. this, this, this kind of cycle where you end up in, in, in a, a kind of rat race where you have mm-hmm. to, to spray, 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 uh, and you're killing more and more and more natural enemies. And then at some point um, you have a big problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it will not happen. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very, very interesting question. The next one is uh, from Joby Meisker. Uh, it said that flowering plants are good as a source for natural enemies. How to know the right ratio between flower plants and main cultivated plants so that ecosystem and production can be maintained? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a very good question. And uh, farmers are also struggling with that. So, for instance, um, in the Netherlands, it might be different than, than in uh, Indonesia, but in, in the Netherlands, um, the, um, er- the, the the prices for land is extremely high. So to, to buy one hectare of land, uh, the farmers have to pay a lot of money. Um, and so therefore they, they also want to have a high production because they have to, they have a big debt. They have to pay back the money to the bank. And so, um, and if they say, well, I'm, I'm going to, I can make, make um, a plant, a flower strip here, uh, but then I have less land to, for my for my crops, and I have a big big bad debt, and I I, uh, I don't get any any money for the uh, for the flower strips, so I, there's no crops. Um, so farmers are on one hand uh, they 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 really would like to to, to help the, the natural enemies by planting these flower strips, but sometimes um, they are in a position uh, that they um, it's economically not uh, not feasible. Now. Um, I think it depends very much on the systems. If, if what I have seen from Indonesian uh, cropping systems, uh, may, maybe um, um, farmers there, there are, for instance, uh, there are sometimes uh, edges, field edges, uh, where there, there might be place for, for flowering plant species. Uh, and, and Uma, I, I think you have also worked uh, uh, with that. Is it a, a Polycaria or what, what was the, this, this plant species? Um, um. That, that you uh, work with. I think it attracted also uh, pollinators and maybe Protalia. also... Protalia. Protalia, yeah. Protalia. Uh, so, is it and, and often this is what, what farmers will do. Mm-hmm. They, they, they will use it on the on the buns, eh, on, on, on the paddy rice fields or on, on, the, on the edges. They, they will plant flowering plant species. And that, that works quite well, particularly if, if the fields are not too big. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, well, it's hard to yeah. say, well, how much do you, mm-hmm. do you need? Yeah. Um, well, in the Netherlands, uh, which is, I think it's very hard to translate to, to uh, Indonesia, but they, they say, well, maybe five to 10% of, of the area on the farm uh, should be um, part for uh, maybe for, for, yeah, for, for flower resources or, or for, for trees or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I don't know sufficient about the Indonesian systems to, to say whether that, that's also true for your, for your systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you have small scale farming fields where you have small paddy fields, um, um, having vegetation on, on those, those buns, eh, on, on the small dikes, uh, I think that, that that can be very effective in, in supporting um, mm-hmm. beneficial insects. And uh, also when there are, when there are flowers eh, or, or weedy mm-hmm. species, uh, mm-hmm. they, they can provide um, important nectar resources for, for pollinators or for uh, natural enemies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh... Uh, with this uh, landscape uh, implementation, we also have a lot of uh, 
yeah, we have to have a quite a big negotiation with farmers how to put, how to use this uh, the rice barn as uh, natural areas and not uh, all of them they do not want to put flowers on the rice barn so they prefer like vegetables or other that can put, uh, that can give uh, income to them so that's why in this like three weeks we try to negotiate with them and finally okay we agree with uh, vegetable but vegetable that also produce flowers so yeah, and and, and that's uh, quite a logic, yeah, because they only have a very small land. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But in some cases, uh, the crops can also provide flowers. Eh? Mm -hmm. Like for instance, if you have uh, pumpkins or maybe other crops. Um, mm -hmm. eh? So um, and and pollinators, for instance, will probably also visit those crops. Eh? So you can also mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be outside the field. It can some in some cases it can also be inside the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, then finally we choose like 15 spaces to be on the rice barn for this almost 100 hectare. Uh, we hope it will work. And uh, the next question uh, from Maria Johanna, uh, is there possibility of an insect became a predator and parasitoid as at the same time? Um. So if to, to have them both at the same time in your agroecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, that, yeah. that is very common. Uh, but um, the, okay. then, then you can, there are all kinds of sorts of, of interesting interactions that, that, that may occur. So one, uh, let's say, positive outcome would be that, for instance, um, that they, uh, the combined um, action of the, the predators and the natural enemies re leads to um, a better uh, biocontrol because the, the pests have no place to go. Eh? Or for instance, on, on, on rainy days, um, the, uh, the, the, the predators are very active and maybe on, 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 the, on the sunny days, the, the parasites are very effective eh? so that you get a better um, division that under all conditions, um, there's at least one group of natural enemies uh, affected. But there could also be less favorable outcomes. And that is for instance, if uh, predators are eating the eggs of uh, um, uh, parasitized um, uh, pests, for instance. Uh, in this case, you 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 can um, actually by eating the um, the pest which has been parasitized. Actually, the the predator is eating uh, the parasitoid larvae, and uh, in this case, um, there there can be. Um, uh, yeah, there, it's not so good because then, then the predators and, and the parasitoids are, are killing each other. Um, mm -hmm. And depending on uh, the, the biology of the system um, and, and, and the, the, the types of natural enemies and their behavior, uh, you can get all kinds of different outcomes. Um, usually uh, having more natural enemies, um, I think in, in the far majority of the cases will always give you um, better uh, biocontrol outcomes. But uh, there are examples where it is not not effective. So that that's better maybe to have maybe one very efficient um, or a limited number of very efficient parasitoids, for instance, uh, and no predators. Uh, but this, this is actually quite rare. Yeah. And the next question are almost the same about stem borer and also about pests on agroecology and then. A stem border again, almost the same. Uh, uh, application of pesticide can be mixed with other materials. I think almost the same, yeah, as previous one. Uh, okay, I want to ask you to do, uh, do you have to use natural enemies? Is there no other way of controlling? Um, well, okay, look, Natural enemies are always around, so uh, in many cases you don't have to do anything because they, they will there be uh, will there be anyway. Um, however, of course, you you can do things um, to to stimulate them, for instance, by planting flower strips eh, or doing things that are that harm them eh, to to use insecticide application when it's not needed. Um, but um, there, uh, one one other strategy is could, for instance, be like say the, the intercropping, um, yeah, because in this way your the intercropping does not affect the per se the natural enemy so much. Yeah, maybe in some cases it, it will do so, 
but it's also uh, make it more difficult for the for the pest to find uh, the host plant. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm not sure if, if this this answers your your question. Um, hey, but um, biological control is is very common. We we see it almost everywhere. Um, so, uh, but it's it's often it's somehow undermined hey, because either there, there are no not sufficient uh, resources in the landscape or there are damaging and uh, management practices that 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 can uh, undermine the, the activities of, of these uh, biocontrol agents. Okay, uh, let's move to the next. Uh, how is the relationship between natural enemies and flower pollination on refugee and plants on the same land? Yeah, I, I think um, so. It, it depends a bit on 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 the kind of plants, eh? and, and we already discussed that. For instance, I gave the example that if you have um, flowers uh, that have very narrow um, tubes, eh? then uh, it could be that 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 some natural enemies, eh? like like parasitic uh, parasitic wasps, eh? that don't have a long tongue, like like bees have, for instance, eh? or other uh, natural enemies with a long tongue, they will not reach the, the nectar. Uh, so uh, it, it could be that that is not, not a very good match. Uh, but uh, often uh, what we see that there is a diversity of natural enemies. And um, in, in many cases, if you plant uh, flowers uh, that can benefit pollinators, um, in, in many cases, it, it will also be good for uh, natural enemies or at least for a part of the natural enemy community. Um, but of course, uh, in... in uh, Ecology, yeah, there are always many exceptions. So that there, there, there could be exceptions uh, that I, I just just explained. Uh, but as a, as a general rule, I would say uh, having more flowers is is a good thing for uh, for your for your health of the uh, agro ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now we have. We still have. Okay. And the next question is: I want to ask about intercropping. Can intercropping system be applied to rice plants? If so, what companion plants are suitable to the plant bed uh, with the rice plant? To be intercropping in rice the fields. In rice. Yes, well, uh, there, there is, for instance, um, also a very famous uh, intercropping um, system, um, but the, in China, so actually where you have the glutinous rice, Mm -hmm. uh, which is actually this, this produces the sticky rice mm -hmm. um, and and other rice varieties um, and and this so they, they they use a kind of mixture of, of two rice varieties so let's say the, the, the standard rice and then this the sticky rice um, mm -hmm. and this sticky rice uh, plants they, they are taller mm -hmm. um, and they are also more susceptible for um, for fun, fun, fungal diseases and what the purpose. And, and uh, so by using this, this mixture of the two rice varieties, uh, you mm -hmm. have much less uh, uh, fungus diseases. Oh. Um, and and, and the, so th that, that is an example. So this is not relating to, to biocontrol, it's more like disease uh, management. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I mean, you, you could think about um, even in, in paddies that, that, you, that you mix different varieties of, of, of rice plants. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if they, they use uh, other uh, intercrops, so um, in, in in rice paddies, or but maybe in, in dryland rice. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some like soya bean rice and mung bean rice. Yeah, there yeah. Are some. Mostly on uh, rice agroforestry system. Yeah. And uh, the next, uh, uh, what will happen if pollinators? Uh, extinct and what step are taken to preserve a pollinator? Yes. Well, if, if pollinators would be extinct, um, that would be a very big disaster because uh, most plant species uh, rely on pollinators for, uh, for reproduction. Um, there are many uh, important exceptions, eh, like for instance, rice or, 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 uh, or wheat eh, uh, that are, are wind pollinated crops. Eh? Also many uh, tree species are wind pollinated. But uh, many vegetables, fruits, um, uh, and, and many wild plants, they, they rely on pollination. Um, so therefore, pollinators are extremely important, and we have to be very careful uh, with them. Um, and uh, at least I know from, from, from Europe um, that there, there is concerns about the decline of pollinators 
Um, I'm, I'm not sure how that is in, in Indonesia. I, I'd be interested to hear if there's anything known about that. I do not know. There's no study yet. Uh, maybe later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think uh, uh, some more questions. They are almost uh, similar to others. So I think uh, we almost uh, done. And that's pity, yeah, that we cannot have your other uh, topic. Uh, maybe, maybe we can use later next year, probably. Um, sure. If you have time later. Yeah, next sure. Year. Okay. okay. And yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Felix. Uh, this uh, really uh, give us uh, many new uh, information and knowledge, especially with the use of camera. And uh, maybe we should do the same here as, uh, in our uh, now experiment with farmers, participatory with farmers. And uh, this is on landscape scale that maybe uh, more, uh, how, do, uh, how do I say it? Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, it's directly uh, to solve the problem of farmers. Of farmers. Okay, and uh, once again, thank you. And I will give it back to Bu Johanna. Bu Johanna, please. All right, thank you, Dr. Rumakuma, your SQMNC. We also thanks to Dr. Felix Fancy, who has provided extraordinary material and discussion. Finally, we come to the end of this event. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your coming and your nice attention. Hope can see you again in another event. Good evening. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Perfect Prof. Thank you, Dr. Felix. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you.